join the join the live studio audience, right? It's a lot of fun. You get to connect with some like-minded, beautiful people after we finish this, and that's where some of the gold really is. Now, tonight, so proud and privileged and honored to interview my, a good buddy, mate Ryan. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm stoked. Uh, welcome, my brother. So, so guys, um, tonight, this is episode number 99. Number 99, right? And it's a weekly episode, so it's been almost two years. And tonight is probably one of the most important topics facing humanity as we stand or as we sit. Because at the end of the day, we know that through all of this situation that we call COVID, you know, people have been isolated and human beings are made to, to be together, not to be separate. Now, some of us have, have, have done really well. We've maybe meditated, gone deeper into who we are and come up with like a, like a renaissance. And others, you know, it's the opposite, right? So we know that mental health, um, there's a tsunami which is already making its way to our shores. And so topics like this is really important because if we don't decide or discuss what it is, how we can spot it, how we can, um, you know, not combat it, but how we can work with it, right? So one of the main reasons why Speak Up Monday came into existence because I lost three friends who committed suicide, right? This is going back some years now. Now, nobody saw it coming because they looked good, smelled good. They had all the things going for them that we thought was success, the trappings of success. But deep down, they were troubled, right? And Monday is the day where people which are looking to commit suicide, that's the most popular day that they do it. So speak up Monday. The idea was that on that day, what we do is that we drop like a stone of positive intention into like a pond of still water with those positive ripples affecting the whole. And that pond is like human consciousness, humanity, right? Because as we know, we're all connected. So, so these, these, these reasons are why tonight is so important. And again, I'm really super glad that, that Ryan um, agreed. And, and like, so to quickly introduce Ryan, amazing person, beautiful heart, massive heart actually. And you know, Ryan, um, you know, like we all have these childhood dreams of playing baseball for the, the Red Sox, uh, the Cubs, winning two World Series rings, right? But the dream, not all of us, right, can reach. He did. But then after that, something that affects a lot of professional athletes after they've had their time, a spate of injuries, 14 operations. Like he went into a maze of mental health that was probably the hardest experience of his life, yet taught him the most. And now he's using that mental acuity to help others navigate their way through the maze. All right. So that's what tonight is about. Without further ado. So first question, Brother Ryan. Now, so take us back, right? So, you know, when you wanted to play, like did you, you grew up dreaming about baseball. Is, is, is that right? Or? Yeah, it was, it was quite simple. My yeah. parents got me a Nerf bat and ball when I was five, and it was like chosen. It was 25 straight years of just wanting to do that, you know, getting my schoolwork done, getting everything just for that itch to be an athlete and to be out there and be competing. And it like started in the neighborhood, you know? I had friends down the street, we had big yards. We had opportunities to be playing every single day. And then when I was around nine, that was when like I hit a home run and I hit a ball further than everyone else. And we were all like, oh wow, this, this might be something, right? And that was like, it was just such a single focused life mm. for such a long time to make that happen. And yeah, man, it was, uh, I gotta say it was like, yeah, it just kind of feels like those first 29, 30 years of my life were almost chosen for me through that itch, you know? Yeah. And um, yeah, it was like anything I had to sacrifice at any time, you know, partying in high school, going to bed early, waking up before school to be practicing with my parents. And that was just kind of, that was the dream. And, you know, I just wanted to really get it. Mm. And uh, and so, what did it feel like, you know, when you uh, when you were selected, when you were chosen, and now you're on your way to professional baseball? Yeah, it was um, actually even that year. I was difficult. I had difficulty with injuries, so I was actually going to be a, a professional pitcher. Oh. 
But then my arm kind of froze in the middle of the season, so it went from, you know, pitching to hitting. And at that time, I only, like, I was kind of like, I think I'm probably going to have to go to college to get this contract that, you know, because at, at a high school level, you need to leverage your your scholarship so that they give you enough money so that the investment is worth you getting a ton of reps to therefore prove yourself to the major league. So at that time, I was like, ah, I'm, I'm hurt. Probably no one's going to come for the asking price and I'm going to go on to college. But the Red Sox were like, no, we want you as a hitter. And I was like, all right, let's go. And to be honest with you, it was getting drafted and then signing and leaving my hometown was really, really hard. Mm -hmm. I like almost didn't sign that contract. I was so terrified of leaving home. Mm -hmm. And then within three days of doing it, it was like, <sighs> but yeah, it was, I, I think I've always had like some anxiety, like, you know, with, yeah. with things and, but you know, that was just the way it was. You're leaving your hometown after 18 years. And then all of a sudden you're like, all right, you're going to go down with people from all around the world, you know, Latin America, Asia, and you're just going to be thrown in this professional world. And I made a couple of quick friends quickly, and that was, it was good. Yeah. You know what I love about, uh, and we, we haven't spoken a lot about this, and um, what, I, what I just, what just dropped in was this, you know, you said before that you felt like the, you were chosen, right? And isn't it interesting because the fact that you went in with the idea of pitching and you were pitching, right? So I haven't played, ba I tried to play baseball once, didn't work out so well. Mm -hmm. uh, but what, what I get is that, you know, like through you being a pitcher would make you a better hitter. Definitely. Because you know exact, you know, just when it leaves the hand, you can see, oh, this is a curveball, oh, this is coming straight, this is a low. Like you can, so isn't it interesting that you went for one, but what it actually gave you was a massive appreciation that made you better. Oh, for sure. At hitting. Yeah, no, it totally did. And then you start anticipating early with that sort of uh, perspective, right? Like I'm, yeah. I started knowing what the pitchers were going to be throwing in certain counts only because I had been a pitcher. So that was definitely a huge advantage. And thinking back on it, man, I'm so happy I was a hitter because at the end of the day, there's just like so much more athletic possibilities being an outfielder and being a hitter. Yeah. The pitching is just a repetition over and over and over, just throwing, 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 throwing. Yeah. Like you don't get to jump over a wall and take someone's home run back and those sort of fun things. So I'm stoked about that too. Fuck, it's awesome. So then, you know, like, so take us through this. So, you know, we mentioned before about there were injuries, right? So you're coming through injuries and, you know, maybe your first injury and you're beginning to maybe feel that, hey, something about my body isn't taking this, right? And, and like, so as I remember a story that you may have told me, you know, there was one time where, you know, you were asked how you're doing, and you knew that you weren't doing good, but you knew this was your shot, mm. right? So take us through, take us through that. Yeah. Well, yeah, the whole the whole injury battle. So I made it to the major leagues, you know, the top level at 22, and then so there's just a lot of hype around the player I'm becoming. The town is starting to get excited. Boston's like, all right, we might have like a new young superstar coming up, and then the next year I dive for a ball like going in and 23 and I tear my left shoulder, right? And it's like, okay, you have a torn shoulder. You know, rehab and you're going to get back. And it's like, all right. And then seven years later, 13 surgeries more. And I'm just like, oh my God. It was like, I can't believe that that happened. But there were six different comebacks to the major leagues within that, right? And I wouldn't have had either of my rings if I didn't have that fight. You know, it was like, I knew I was good, good enough to play at the highest level and it was just like, no, I'm not gonna give up. Like, I'm gonna push this thing to the limit. And, you know, most guys after three to five surgeries, they kind of call it, but, you know, it was just like, it was just always on the brink of reaching that potential and then slip it away. And then build it, build it, build it, build it, build it go slip away and I just kept doing that right until I was yeah 29 some major props man because 
as you mentioned, most people give up after five. Uh, maybe some give up after one or two. So what was it within you that would not accept defeat? What was it within you that was triggered? Because it, it's like there's, a, there's, a, there's an animal inside you, right? You, you present as a very calm man, right? And I get that. But inside must look some kind of beast. Because to take that sort of punishment, mentally, physically, emotionally, knowing that your body is not there, but you're like, no way, this is my shot. So what, what was it that kept you going, and where do you think it came from? Oh, man, honestly, it was probably attachment. I don't know. It was like attachment to that elite level, attachment to proving everyone wrong. I, I mean, in my last, like... My last comeback, which got me the 2016 Chicago Cubs World Series, somebody told me as I was rehabbing that I would have a better shot winning the lottery. And I was like, yeah, man. <laughs> and that just is like this fire, right? But it's like, so there was definitely those little things along the way. But yeah, it's an attachment to your childhood, your inner child. I was baseball. I'm like, and you're still showing that you can get back to that level. Like, you can't give up. But ultimately, it really did like, there was this, it was, I was 29 and I was in the spring training game and my right knee was just throbbing after four surgeries in three years. And it was like, it was honestly like such an emotional end, right? Like I asked the, the manager for one last at bat and I got up there, took it, got a base hit and just like walked off the field and just like sobbing, man, just like wouldn't stop for a while and then actually the few months afterwards too were like you know just filled with like daily tears I would put on Rufus de Sol underwater and I would just be like Boop! start crying every day and then I'd go to Pilates you know mm -hmm. I don't know maybe I made it my way into the End, end of the baseball, but maybe we're there. Uh, the, we, <laughs> the beautiful thing about this is that there's there's no structure. Yeah. We go wherever the, the energy takes us, so we just follow it, brother. Mm -hmm. So then, so when you said that you came off the field and you were crying, so or sobbing, so what was it that created that? That was like true knowledge that I had taken it to the maximum. Yeah. Fourteen total surgeries, twelve years. You know, what I had done was what I was going to do in baseball. That was the accomplishment of my playing career, and I couldn't take the pain anymore. And it's just like the lifestyle kind of gets to you. You know, you're in the middle of Connecticut. It's cold. I'm like, I could, you know, I just like, just the energy was just expended totally. But it was a big tank, that's for sure. A big tank of energy. And if I ask you this question, whatever comes in your mind first, so what were you scared of? about retiring oh man it was what I'm still scared of N not like I don't know there's just like I, I want to like I want to be like the, I want to be a game changer you know I want to leave I don't know it's like and honestly in the you know baseball is a very small world so you think like you're making this huge impact on the world but I guess like yeah it was just like I went into the shell of rebirth and I was like what am I going to leave behind if like that wasn't it because I was so sure and then it's like yeah purpose mm. it was terrifying man it was so weird like I couldn't I moved to my hometown where I grew up at first and I could barely walk outside mm. it was like my hands were shaky my body was weird I'd be walking down the street after that and I'm just like it was like my nervous system was taking this new direction and I had no idea what was going on yeah. Got it, brother. Got it, man. And, and so, Bali, right? So remember we had this quick chat, and, and you mentioned that, that, that Bali, the first time you come here, like, there was a massive fear for, for you. Something, can you tell us a little bit more about, about that, if it was fear or if it was a different feeling that, that you had? What about coming to Bali? Yeah, when you first came. Well, I think we need to go back just a little first, right? Because, yeah. like... Um, yeah, so the post-baseball thing, that was just like, you know, the first few months. And then um, luckily the Pilates career came around and that gave me this purpose, right? I was t took on this 600-hour course. You know, you got to log all these hours. You got to take tests, learn the body. And like, okay, that gave me like this 
this sense of purpose, and it really calmed down the anxiety and depression for me for a while. Um, and then, and then there was the the psychedelic drugs. Okay, right? Like, for me, I had dabbled in them throughout my life, and then that post baseball, I decided, okay, like, these are kind of fun, and I can feel my mind expanding, and I, you know, I'm going to enjoy them, right? But I took it too far, and it kind of caused me to go off that trajectory of the Pilates, and it actually, like, I felt so powerful from these experiences of expansion and, like, feeling like, you know, I was a very powerful being that I could play baseball again. So I veer off this path of coaching mental skills for the Dodgers and doing Pilates, and I go to Australia, and that was where, like, once the uh, pain in my knee came back, the depression and everything just went boom. And that was when I first started thinking about killing myself. Mm. Like, I was, you know, I was like, wow, like, baseball's really over. I thought I was this big, powerful being through, you know, the psychedelic realm. And I came to Bali at the end of my stint in Australia just because I figured if I was going to go back to the United States and kill myself, I needed to see Bali because all my friends told me it was going to be sweet. So I stayed here in Canggu. I stayed actually like 20 meters from where I'm living now. And I couldn't even drive the bikes. I would just walk down to the beach, cry, come back, eat meals, just completely out of, you know, just out of it. And then I flew back to the U.S., where my parents drove me to Arizona and I checked in for like 30, 30 nights in a psych ward sort of deal, like that mental health, like, okay, pharma now. So switching from that to that and mm. just getting all these, um, you know, the labels, the bipolar label, the medicines start pumping through your system. And um, yeah, that like, there was like eight to 12 months of that sort of a period of time, even getting out of that um, you know, mental health facility to where it was just a battle every day. It almost felt like I was just waking up in a, in a bad psychedelic trip every single day, just completely sober, just being like, oh no, it's a new day. And there would be thoughts of like, just, just end it. Just do it. This is stupid. Like, you're just just wasting everyone's time around you. You're wasting your own time. And yeah, it was like, it was a while. And then I found purpose again through my own mind. I came up with um, a fitness invention, and that kind of gave me a little bit of, it gave me a little bit of spark, right? And long story short, um, you know, having that invention kind of it gave me that life again. And then I ended up coming here to develop it, right? And it's kind of been this nice upward trajectory just from strictly finding purpose, you know? So it, anyway, it kind of makes me seem like, it makes me think there should be this different sort of help for people that are going through these sort of things. Mm, love it, brother. And, you know... So the interesting part of this is that uh, even though this is a Q and A, it's not about answering the questions. Mm. It's about what's triggered by the question. So that's why I mean that there's no. Fl it's just yeah. flow. It's just flow, my brother. So let's talk about depression again. So, so like for me personally, I feel like I've been depressed. Mm -hmm. There was a time where I was uh, oh, between the age of eight and twelve, children's home in London pejoratively black. Only black kid at school for the first 14 years. All my friends were white. I identified with a Caucasian set of values in how I should look, how I should speak, how I should hold myself, and all the rest of that. I would come home and I'd put the mirror in front of my face in, in my bedroom, and I would pull myself apart and say, your nose is too wide. Your lips are too big. You got a pointy head, even though I had hair back then. Right? But I still had a feeling. You got a pointy head, man. And uh, and so I used to go right down to the rabbit hole and just see these are all the things I want to change that I'm not happy with. And I just kept on like like really ripping myself to shreds. 
and I contemplated, I don't think I ever would have done it, but I contemplated like, fuck it, you know, like, what's the point? But I was deeply, what I felt was deeply depressed, but maybe I was just down. So for you when, you, when you use that word depression in such a strong word, what does it mean to you? Deep rest. Mm. Uh, I think that was a big part of it for me, even though like there was such a fight internally to like not want to just take that time to rest and, and sleep and like let my body recover or let my emotions. And, you know, I think... Um, yeah, it was a deep rest, but it also was just like so hard to be told by all these different places what was wrong with me mm. or what I was going through. Mm. Um, because in time, I kind of feel like it was just time that helped me. Mm. Like all the experiments with, you know, the, the lithium drug for bipolar and um, obviously my own experiment through psychedelics and then, you know, switching up the medicine to finally just an antidepressant. Mm -hmm. It was, a lot of it was time. And I feel like if there was like a people just wanting to help me find a new direction, mm -hmm. maybe that would, you know, that's like enough to help somebody. Mm -hmm. It's, um, yeah, I kind of have this thing about pharma world, you know, mm -hmm. it feels very businesslike to me. It's not a, like it doesn't feel like it's enough about the individual and what they're going through. Mm. Um, but that's just my opinion. Mm. Well, your opinion is what we're after, my brother. And I mean, um, so to f complete that side of it. So, so in the darkest of times mm -hmm. in my room, all these voices in my head telling, end it, change this, change that, you're not good enough, all the rest of that, came one voice for the first time, which was this, it was a warm voice that was supportive, and it was the first time I ever heard it. And I remember it to this day, right? So it was me in that moment of, of just pure vulnerability, weakness, um, just those thoughts taking me, spiraling me down into this, what felt like a never-ending pit of despair, Yeah. right? And from that point was a voice which I heard for the first time, and it said to me, Rob, just look after your skin. Right? Rob, just look after your skin. Now, that voice was the voice that pulled me out of that chasm. Not straight away, but over time. Because whenever I would get to that point and I would start to spiral down, that voice would say something else. But I recognized the frequency and the tone of that voice. Mm. And, I, and I just, I yearned for it, right? My heart was like, this is what I know that I want. And slowly, slowly, I used to follow that voice. And that voice began to bring me up. So now for you, you mentioned the psychedelics and you mentioned about the invention that began to show you a purpose. Because I, I really do feel, right, that, that we all have this voice. But it's just a matter of us silencing enough of the bullshit that goes on around us to listen to the wisdom within ourselves. Call it God, call it whatever you want to call it, but it's there. So for you, when I bring that up, like you mentioned the invention, but I want to go back. So was there any voice for you or anything, or did that invention literally come out of thin air? Uh, no, the, I mean, it kind, yeah, it kind of did come out of thin air, honestly. I was watching uh, my ex-girlfriend's little boy build stuff all the time, and I'd play with him, and you know, that was like such a great part of my days, but... Um, yeah, he would always just build these things. And I started thinking about the evolution of fitness and some ideas that I have for like the body and what I think could really help um, through my own injuries and the Pilates. And yeah, I'm like, I think it's a couple weeks away. It's being made here at the Bali Design Center. And I'm like super excited about it. Um, but yeah, it was just like, I, you know, maybe that's the, the purpose of why I got hurt because this, this invention, this thing is going to like change, I think, I hope, the way that we think about fitness in some certain ways. So I'm really, yeah. So, but even the thing about it too, though, is that I actually feel now, because everyone would always say this, they're like, you know, baseball was just one thing and like not a lot of people get that clear cut, straightforward. 30 year life thing, right? They f go through life and they're doing one thing for a while and then it 
they get fired and they go here and they go here and that was like such a hard concept for me and I'm like all right either I'm making a really like it's going to be a worldwide hit fitness adventure I'm making myself a cool toy and something is going to come and like I'm starting to embrace that mindset that I like in the beginning I was like no there's got to be one thing out there and I'm going to find it and then the next 30 years I'm going to be doing just that Mm. and now I'm just like that's not true and I love that. So uh, what I'm recognizing with you, which I recognize from, from the beginning, right, is you have this enormous heart, right, this enormous desire to have impact, meaning, right? And, you know, like, my question to you is, because this invention clearly is on that road, right? And the things I know about you, there's many other things which are going in that direction. But if I would ask you, you know, like, where do you think that sense of, needing to have impact in a positive, powerful way, where do you think it came from? Man, that's a good question. Um, Honestly, I think it really comes from my parents, you know? I think they always, you know, I just got really lucky with some really amazing parents that um, you could just you could just tell like they just wanted the best for you no matter what even like you know in retrospect now because like it's even really hard for us to get in touch my parents and I right now because of the time difference and you have all these years of just you know there was always some tension I think that's pretty normal for parents and their kids but it's all love and like now that I'm sitting out on the back back end like I'm like yeah they were really just wanted me to thrive and do really well in life and yeah like of course I'm a kid I always think I know more than my parents for a little and we butt heads and now it's like but um yeah no I think that's where it comes from and honestly I think um yeah it's from some some higher place for sure Mm. I don't really know Got it, brother. Yeah. Got it, man. And so I bumped into this, uh, the teachings of this lady called Bronnie Ware. So Bronnie Ware, B-R-O-N-N-I-E. So Bronnie Ware, W-A-R-E. So Bronnie Ware is, uh, she works in palliative care. So what that means is that she works in a terminal ward of a hospital, been doing it for many years. And so this ward is where people come when they're given two to four weeks left to live. So they're going to die, right? So now, apparently, you know, when you get to that place, maybe some fight that feeling that, I'm, that it's done, I'm over, that it's over. But at some point comes this feeling of acceptance. I'm going to pass away. And, and something just drops. And she's seen this so many times. But what she did over many years is that she asked some questions. Is there anything you regret? Mm. that you wish you would have done. You're, you're at the end of your life. Is there anything you regret that you wish you would have done? And she's, so it's called Regrets of the Dying. Check her out. Bronnie Ware, Regrets of the Dying. Super powerful. She's, it's been turned into a film. A movie's been made right now. I think it may have been made already. Uh, book, programs, a whole, whole nine yards. She's amazing, right? And, um, but I'll shortcut this. The number one regret of the dying, thousands of people now, the number one regret of the dying had nothing to do with money, had nothing to do with um, the people that I'm around or what should I do. It was this. It was, you know, I wish I would have lived the life which I wanted to live, not the life that others wanted for me mm-hmm. to live, right? So once more, I wish I would have lived the life that I wanted to live, not the life that other people wanted me to live. Which, which it hit me at the time. I was like, fuck, you know, like, whoa. It made me reassess what I was doing because I felt like I was being, I was just going on the same track as everybody else. But when you hear that, what comes up for you? Yeah, um, well, when you're asking for a lot of help, when you're real, like, in it and you're feeling sad and depressed and all the things, a lot of people, um, you know, they offer their advice. And, you know, it's like, I know... A lot of it for me was get back into baseball and coach, and I kept hearing it right. And not, I just think I, I did it for a little while, but I, I did it out of fear too, because you know everyone, you know, it's like get a job, health insurance, you're in the U.S., all that, and there was this resistance for me. And 
I think that's why I'm here in Bali, really, is because, you know, like you said, I don't want to be at that stage in my life and be thinking I didn't try something, like come to, you know, other side of the world, this place, this world renowned for its beauty and the, like, you know, the ability to really slow down and sink in. And I'm just stoked that I'm doing it, you know, because like, you know, I, I came here and it's been quite a journey since I've been here already. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's, I've always had that like against the cut sort of deal that in me. And um, I, I'm just happy that I'm following it. So it's good. Yeah, I love it, man. And that against the cut, I really would love to know where it came from, man, because your parents, you know, imbued you with a sense of love, a sense of purpose, a sense of, you know, like this unity consciousness actually is what it is. It's like this, this understanding that we're part of a bigger whole, which is greater than the sum of its parts, if we can put our heart there, right? But this mongrel within you, I don't know why it keeps coming up. I want to know, right? But this mongrel within you, could I feel it, man? Like, like, oh, I want to. So what happened to you, man? Was there something that happened to you that you remember um, that brought out this, like, pardon the French, is fuck you, like this, because you're against the cut, man. Th th that doesn't just happen. Okay, so, yeah, my best friend, his name is Lars Anderson, um, you know, we were hanging out in off seasons and I, I got to know his family really well. And they're, you know, Northern California, Lars' dad, George, he uh, served in Vietnam, um, you know, and he came back and experienced kind of like the unappreciated sort of world and he you know he got into the hip you know the hippie movement and he got in right so i'm growing up listening to a lot of people in my life talk about like kind of what's you know like oh you're hearing this thing on the news but that might not really be what's going on <laughs> and i'm just like really i kind of i liked it i was like this is cool man like i never thought like this before i never thought about like what you know like maybe you shouldn't believe everything you hear sort of thing. And yeah, that's, you know, that's kind of what did it for me. Just years and years and years of hearing about, you know, just, I don't know what people would call conspiracy theories. I really kind of hate that, but it's, you know, just against the cut thinking, you know, you're not just going to listen to what you hear on CNN or Fox. Mm -hmm. You're going to be like, eh, I'm going to do some of my own research. So yeah, that's kind of where it came from. Mm, got it, brother. Got it. Because it keeps... It feels like it keeps reappearing in your life, like yeah. 14 times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 14 operations, that's 14 times, man. That's, that's full on, brother. Yeah, and you know what? So I, I, that's another part of it, too, against the cut, is like when it came to, you know, a lot of the coaching that I got in those days about, like, positive affirmations. Um, and I, I, I really do think they're super important, but... I told myself I was going to get healthy a hell of a lot of times, and I believed it, and it didn't happen. So there's like a little bit of that, like you know what I mean? Like, uh, I don't know about all, like you know what I mean? Like some things are just going to happen to you, no matter like how powerful you think about it. Mm. And I guess I don't know. Just like for me, it's just like being a little like real with myself. Yeah. Like I don't get to choose everything that happens to me. Um, but I can fight, you know, because I fought through all that. And then um, my, you know, after the career, my brain and my life and my body was saying, kill yourself. And I was like, no, I'm going to fight because I did, you know, just to get to that other spot. So it's, yeah, I don't know. Definitely against the grain. Um, just kind of like hear things and certain, yeah, certain, certain things trigger me against the grain. But I won't say it all the time. I just think in my head, like, I don't know. <laughs> Got it, brother. Yeah. Got it, man. So now, moving forward, so what I love about your story as well is that you know, this feeling, this need, this desire to impact, to be fulfilled in your life, but fulfill the lives of others, I love, right? So now, mental acuity, so you're becoming a mental acuity coach. Now, so stepping into that container for a second, you know, so if somebody is depressed or thinks that they are depressed, I guess number one would be, you know, is there any um, symptoms that maybe loved ones around them would be able to notice or to recognize? And I'll preface this. So remember, one of those friends of mine that committed suicide, no one ever saw it coming. We weren't close friends. 
We were not close. We had close moments, but I still consider him a friend. Successful guy, hospitality, killing the game, successful restaurants, like killing it. Handsome guy, beautiful girl, all the rest of that, like everything from the outside looking in. But no one really saw what was kind of happening. So, so just with that container and the mental acuity coaching, you know, is there any way that people can, can see or recognize any types of symptoms? I guess my own experience is I'm just, I'm very lucky that I was so vocal about it. I was just like super open. Um, but I think that a big thing for people just who are around other people in general is just feel, you know, empathy. Like, you know, even though I, like, like I was just talking about like the affirmations and stuff, if somebody's super into that, that's amazing. You know what I mean? And like meeting somebody where they're at all the time, no matter like what they're saying, especially as a family member, um, I don't necessarily know if you can always see it coming, yeah. but if you can hold space for someone to feel comfortable to say anything to you, mm -hmm. then like for the real silent ones, there's mm -hmm. I think a chance. But I think the second you get like that, you know, it, you say something, an opinion, and I'm like, oh, that's just dumb. And like that happens in families. It. it happens. Yeah, it just like shuts it down. It, the openness can can kind of be obsolete from then on. Um, but yet yeah, to say like you can truly see any signs of that coming, mm. I think is like not always the case. Mm. Yeah, I, I would I would go along with that. I mean, it's yeah, it's just bring back brings back memories, you know. Mm -hmm. Like these guys were cool, man. Yeah, They're crazy. And then um, so then if somebody now you know would would ask you, so you mentioned about holding space for people, uh, that empathy. Right, which I love. Beyond that, you know, if somebody is, so when you were suffering, you know, from depression, I know it comes back and some forwards, but how did you find your way out? So what I'm talking to now is through that. What can I do to help me to maybe get to that next step? Wow. So, you know, for me, there definitely became a point where I had been so vocal about it for so long where it was just like I don't know I felt like even my parents were kind of and my, my brother they were kind of just sitting there like alright is he gonna is he gonna do it yeah. so there was a point where it just got to be too much for pretty much everyone I lost friends you know cause it was like it was just hard energy to to equate yourself with and like I'm sh yeah I don't know if anyone's watching but I that is going through that but I, there's definitely people out there <laughs> Um, yeah, I think, I think the, the number one question is like, are you truly happy with what you're doing? Or maybe are you like thinking about something else? Like, are you doing one job that you completely despise just for the money? And should you be looking elsewhere? I think that's, you know, I think what people are up to is probably like such a, a, a huge part of it. And making that shift into something else. Um, like I said, the purpose finding, like that was, that's what I kind of always really feel like would help people deep down the most. Like what is, what are, what are you gonna wake up and be excited to do? You know, I th that's what I think. Got it brother, thank you man, thank you. And what excites you at the moment? Oh man, all right, so for me, a fitness routine is back. Yeah. You know, I took a, I couldn't really do it for a while just because like I didn't have the energy and now it's, you know, my, my mornings are dedicated to fitness. Um, what excites me is the possibility of, of this fitness device that I, that I have. And it's actually going to be like, I have my villa right at, next to Mason. So y'all can try it when it's ready. Um, anyone in town, um, that really excites me. You know, some of the, the projects that I've been able to be involved with, um, helping to be a part of this school in Sumbawa, um, the Anakalam Learning Center, and bringing, like, opportunities to kids over there. And, yeah, the other thing that excites me is the surprise of what could come. Mm. You know? Because, like I already told you, I accept it, all right? There's not one thing that I'm going to do now that baseball's over. It's going to be this flow of trying new things, um, 
and I just, I honestly feel like there is surprises to come, and that's cool. Mm. Love it, man. Love it. Now, now we're going to be going to questions pretty soon, so anyone here in the studio audience that feels like they have a question, just raise your hand in about three minutes or so, and then one of the guys will bring a microphone to you. Just remember when, just turn this towards your mouth, it sounds funny, but every week everyone does. Yeah. And one, does, it's, it's, it's like a deer in a headlight. <laughs> and they wonder why no one can hear them. So um, but that's come back two or three minutes. So what comes up for me is, so this, uh, you know, I've got friends who've been professional athletes. I was a professional athlete very young. And, um, but I've got friends who, who were later on as adults. Some of them had huge drops afterwards, similar to what happened to you. So perhaps for those professional athletes who are watching now, you know, like, is there any advice, guidance, insights that you could give to them that could help them either avoid what happened to you or to find a different way to meet it in a way that doesn't take so much from them? I think preparation during one's career is, is something that would be really helpful to do, like kind of start thinking outside of the game that you're playing. Um, and I think that was a big issue for myself that I was so singularly focused, you know, even past, even past the retirement, you know, like to where like you know, your, your brain is scrambling for what's next. So, you know, definitely kind of being intrigued to, you know, what's out there, like what excites you about the future outside of this game, even if it's kind of hard for you to think about. Cause there was, you know, I got asked that and I was just like, nah, that's not going to be me. I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to be retired financially. It's going to be done, and then I'm whatever. Um, and that really, I think, gets people in trouble because when it's like just like creating that neuroplasticity in your brain to be like so on that, mm -hmm. to not have you know those other sort of examples. So I don't know. Maybe there would be like maybe there is a coach out there for that 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 helps you just like straight find your what you're excited about um yeah i think that would be good and then if you do like for me with all the injuries i can't necessarily go out and get into another sport and continue to be an athlete like a competitive athlete i have to get mine out in the gym but hopefully for most of these athletes any like they don't have as many injuries and they can go play beach volleyball for 30 years <laughs> that would be really helpful got it brother Go to yeah. my man. Thank you, my brother. But yeah. we're, still, we're still going, but just at yeah. this point, no, we're not done, man. I'm not, but, I'm but, not ready to be done. Good, good. <laughs> so, guys, so any questions, um, put your hand up, and we, we'll, get the, we'll get the microphone to you. Don't be shy. Yeah, just over here, two. Maybe ladies first. Yeah. I think it's a lot long enough better anyway for her, yeah. So ladies first. Yep, yeah. Yeah, 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 and then, then we'll go to that beautiful man there. All right, um, my name is Annie. Thanks, um, Ryan, for saying your story. It's really interesting. So um, my question is, what does it mean the death for you after all this story you've been through? Like you were scared. Um, I just want to kill myself, and you know, some people ready to date. You know, some people just like I don't want to date now. I don't want to facing all this grave and stuff. So what does it mean, the date for you? What does it mean today for me? Yes, after you've been through all this kind of story and experience. Such a long time. Thank you. I think that um, you should, like, yeah, if you're equating life to, like, a lemon or an orange and you want to get the juice out, don't squeeze it too hard. It's like that nice, like, pulsing, like, getting down to it. Because, um, you know, I guess, like, with the professional sport that I played in mind, it was kind of always that. Like, how much more juice can you squeeze out to where if you kind of live life more like, you know, tending to that fruit and getting, it, getting the juice out smoother, the, just the better overall I think your day-to-day -day life's going to be, you know? I mean... I can't, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know too much about working at a computer, but if you did six hours at a computer or nine, you know, 
do you really think you're getting that much more done? I don't know. It's just like, you know, like enjoy it. Yeah. And just, that's kind of what I'd say. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So next question, which is just over here. Yeah, just you can just pass that one along. Just pass the cable down. Great, great teamwork, girls. Love it. Teamwork. Love it. So sense of purpose is something that's a, a challenge for a lot of people, including myself. And I'm just wondering if you have any lessons that you learned along your way with pieces of wisdom that you picked up in, in your struggles with that and, and if you can share anything there. Yeah, I, I think um, for me, like when the comfort zone is getting like infringed upon, that's typically a time where I'm just going to say yes and go like right into it, you know, like, and I've also done the other thing where like, you know, you have like this new social circle and somebody asks you to go out to dinner and you're just like feeling that little bit of like social tension and you just stay home. Whereas like if you had went, you don't know who you might've met. You don't know what kind of idea somebody could have given you. Um, yeah, so just continuing to, like, put yourself out there. You know, because that's a good, you know, like, when you're in it and you're purposeless or you feel like you don't have it yet, you're just not as confident. But, like, that purpose is over here and, like, your general, like, the way you look, the way, you know, just you getting out there is a completely different entity. Um, so, yeah, I think, like, really pushing through that is is something that... I luckily did, you know, like even in those days where I was really struggling, I would go teach four hours of Pilates. And then I started to get the idea for what the invention that I have is now. So it's kind of just like, yeah, pushing, pushing through that anxiety. Like there's something to be said for that. Thank you. Yeah. Now I'm gonna put someone on the spot. This is a guy who I love also, and he's such an amazing story, and, um, and he's smiling at me without knowing I'm gonna choose him, because we didn't rehearse this, we don't rehearse, we don't rehearse anything anyway. But, and I'm gonna get it right this time, Alka. So Alka was uh, former Dutch Marines. Got it? Okay, could you pass back the microphone to, to Alka? So this mental health affects so many people, and Alka's story, and he's going to be on the couch one day pretty soon, mate. Uh, but can you talk into your challenges with mental health after, I think it happened after leaving the Marines? Yeah, I think because I had the same question you asked uh, him. Uh, it's very similar, I think, to the life of an athlete. I was in the Marines for 14 years. Like, you have to be on your max all the time because it's a life or death situation. So, and I think ending that, there's no real preparation for going into civil life and 14 years of being pushed into your purpose because everybody, it's like you've been told what to do for every single small thing in your life. And then ending that and being like thrown in out to the wild, you know? It was the biggest struggle for me, finding what drives me. Uh, still struggling with it, but yeah. Wow. No, I, yeah, that's such a good point. Yeah, it's like eating here, training here, eating here, go to bed. Yeah. And like, yeah, and then there's nothing really there to catch you um, when you come out of those two situations. And I, now that I'm like thinking about it, I can remember just like, even freaking out about what time I go to the grocery store because like um, it was my choice now it's like it's my choice and I'm like not feeling confident about myself I'm like oh, I think the market's gonna be too crowded at five I should go at three <laughs> like dealing with that so yeah and then it's also the societal portion you know you're on a team this small team as a marine or as a baseball player there's 25 of us traveling together in this little bubble and then, um, yeah, and, and our performances is really all that matters, right? Um, and, you know, it's like a statistically driven game, and I don't have to, like, t 
talk about myself or sell myself on social media. It's just, I'm either hitting 300 or I'm cut, you know? And like now that's something, I don't know, I'm struggling with too. Even just like talking about myself on the internet as a coach, it's weird for me. I don't really like it. <laughs> like it's, it really, it like, it's hard for me. That's why I'm like kind of hopeful that my invention will just be this like showing what I like what I made. But yeah, it's like um, it's completely doesn't prepare you at all for society and the working force. It's not. You know, I really appreciate you sharing, and I love I love you too, man. It's like here's the thing, right? Your life has been a testament to not only coming back from adversity, to not only finding the way through or that way finding you. It, we're going back to where this started off. Like, I do believe as well that you were chosen, right? And every challenge that you've faced, you've not only overcome, but who you have become by overcoming that challenge has then imbued you to serve others even more. So, like, the fact that, and I, I love the fact that you, you're, I like, you've always been straight up and honest, and I love that about you, man. But, uh, but the fact you're saying that, like, it's difficult for you to speak as a coach on camera and, and, and so on, though, I know that when you're with people, it's, it's just, you're just like, it's just straight up, right? It's just straight on. But here's the thing, you know, like, after this, like, part of what Speak Up Monday does, which, which I really enjoy, is that, you know, for the audience, get value because we're sharing something and there's a connection, there's a collective intelligence that we're all part of and the questions that come are not from me, they're from that place, mm -hmm. right? And you respond from that place too. But the, the bit which I love and I call it the clock, so 12 till one or one to 12, and it's like 12 till one is, is a bit like, this is what I know that I know. I know my name, I know my shoe size, I know how tall I am, I know how fast I can run 100 meters, or I used to. And then one to two is like, this is the stuff that I know that I don't know. I don't know how the rocket gets into space, I know that there's fuel that's burnt and it goes up. But I don't know nuclear fission. And then two, or even three, all the way to 12 is stuff that this is what I don't know that I don't even know, right? What I don't know that I don't know. Don't know that I don't know. So what happens is that when we do this, those questions that come not from me, but from that, it triggers something within us to begin to look into that place. It may happen on the spot, but usually it's a few days afterwards. And it opens up a doorway and when you move through that doorway, something quite incredible happens. So again, the audience get value because you're giving value, because you're being honest, authentically you, and we all can connect to that. You are getting value because we reach into that place of the clock, places maybe you haven't thought about for a while, or places where you haven't gone to, or places you've never thought about. And then in the next few days, it's like something opens up, a doorway opens up, and I don't know, I don't know what that doorway will be for you, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's, you know, I, this is the last story. Um, there's a beautiful girl, right, called Matilda Duilestadi that maybe some of you know. So she is the first Indonesian woman, women's team, there's two of them, her and Francisca, and they completed the Seven Summits Challenge. Okay, Seven Summits Challenge is you climb the highest mountain on seven continents, including Mount Everest. So she's just like, forget it, she's about this tall. Amazing, right? So cutting a long story short, she came to a Speak Up Monday back in the, in the days that we had it in life in Bali. She was introduced to us by a mutual friend. And within 30 seconds, I picked up her energy. That following week, for some reason, don't know why, um, there was no speaker. Okay, so I knew within 30 seconds that she was going to be on the stage next week. She didn't know, but I did. I just met her, right? I'm cheeky, you know me. So I was like, look, Tilda, you're going to be on the stage next week. She's like, no, I'm not. I go, no, you are. You're not. You're not. I am. You're not. You are. Went back and forth a couple of times. So what ends up happening, not from me but from whatever you want to call it, Rob, Q&A. 
think? I said, okay, you know what? Are you afraid of speaking on stage? He goes, yes, I'm afraid. I went, come on, you climbed all these mountains and you're afraid of speaking on, come on. Okay, fine, we'll do a Q and A. And when someone looks at you in the eye and you know that they're gonna say yes because they've got nothing left to resist and you just, you're, you're there going like, will it take five seconds, 10, 10, and you count down, like when you go under like a, an anesthetic, count to 20, you, you never reach five. I'm there going like, eh, and she goes, okay, then I'll do it. So she was on the next week. Now, that girl, incredible soul, after she did that, went on to speak in public so many times. She went on television and all this stuff. Like she, you can't shut her up. Like she just goes on, right? But it came out of that. It came out of her being honest with herself and just laying it open and just saying, you know, like this is what I'm afraid of and being open um, to looking at that, mm. you know. And, and, and actually it had a secondary effect. That's why Speak Up Monday became Q&A only. This is episode number 99. That was episode number 40 something from memory. But after she did the, after we did it as purely a Q&A as opposed to a presentation followed by a Q&A, I knew that Q&A was the way to go. And so she was the one who changed the game, actually. So Matilda, if you're watching, honey, thank you very much. You're gonna be back on soon. Love you, right? Uh, so it's amazing what happens, man. Yeah. So, so like, again, like you have such a f phenomenal potential and you hold space for people in such a beautiful, powerful way without saying anything. So you've got the juice, brother. You've got the juice, you've got the experience. He's a handsome guy. You've got the look. <laughs> Thank you. You have, man, you've got the experience. Like, like you're gonna kill it. You know, like, you, you were born for this, is the way I see it. Yeah, I think there's a, a new, like a, a new market of like, coaching through your experience rather than coaching or, helping through a formal education. Yeah. Um, and I, and yeah, I would love to tap into that market. You know, I think that's just such a, a brilliant thing. Cause you know, even, you know, again, going through my, the mental health journey, I'm not sure if all of the doctors that prescribed me the medicine had been through what I've been through and were thinking the way I was thinking. Um, and yet yeah, at the end of the day, in that experience, I didn't ever really feel heard, you know? Like, what about someone who just hears you and they didn't, you know, go to Harvard, to, you know, to get a, a, a mental health degree. They just simply hear you and have been there and they help you that way. That, that can be just as helpful as doctors and medicine and all those things. So, mm. yeah, I'm definitely in on that. You know, and like you said, I, I definitely love like just hanging out with someone and listening to them. Um, tell me about their life and not what color they like, but what they've been through, Yeah, you know, like, let's get down to it. Yeah. Um, I'm into that. Love it, man. Love it. Yeah. So look, uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, so maybe they're watching this and they say, Hey, this guy, Ryan, like I really gravitate. I feel his vibe. I resonate with him. So how can people get in touch with you? What's the best way? Um, like Instagram is super easy. It's I am Ryan Kalish. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the way. Cool, e e so. you know, Email, of course, but that's on there. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, brother. So I am Ryan Kalish. So now, if there are no more questions, so the way we end the show, my brother, if you have another question. Yeah. Yeah, cool, let's do it. Yeah. So professional sports or sports in general, you often find yourself in this really competitive mindset and you know, hyper-focused, things like that. So did you struggle at all or can you relate to coming out of that culture and then integrating into, I guess, normal society, normal culture? Did you feel like you needed to make adjustments or did that adjustment contribute to this sort of bottom falling out? Um, yeah, man. Actually, if, um, Instagram really was a big, big trigger of me feeling worthless for a long time. And I don't know if it's a competition aspect as much as it was just like, I see these like people doing major things. And if I'm not going to be a major league baseball player, I need to do something major. And you're just sitting there in like this spiral at your house and you just woke up at 1 PM and you're just so hazy and sad. And <laughs> you're just scrolling through Instagram, seeing like somebody doing something awesome. And, um, 
I don't think, but it might have been the competition being dormant as well as just seeing people do really well. I think I've felt a little um, healthy competition because that's the thing. It was really pretty healthy competition because, you know, your fellow outfielders, you're competing against them, but you're also friends, right? So like people that I, I, I get together with now that are up to big things when I'm with them, uh, yeah, there's always a little like envy in a beautiful way. You know, it's like, I want to be like that, man. You know, that's um, something that comes up. So it, and for me, that's much healthier than feeling like, like, yeah, non-friendly competition. Cool. cool. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, guys. Any more questions for anybody? Yeah. Okay. So then, uh, Brother Ryan, so how we end the show is that uh, it comes to you and in about a minute or so. And what it is is that uh, if there's anything that you're called to say, it could be repeating something you said already. It could be something new that you think, hey, I want to talk about that. It can be as long or as short as you like. I'm going to give you that opportunity in about a minute, all right? So, so just uh, I'll let you think about it, brother. <laughs> cool. cool. I, I know you got this, brother. So, uh, guys, so this is uh, Speak Up Monday, Destination Indonesia. So Destination Indonesia, because it focuses on people who are either born here or people that call Indonesia Bali home for whichever period of time. That could be weeks, could be months, could be years. And the idea behind it is that it's people inspire people and binika tunggul ika, which means unity in diversity. And these are the things that I love personally, which are wired into the DNA of what we do here every week. It just happens light like that, because it's the intention. So if you feel drawn to be part of this, I know there's one in the audience, Jagati, you're up. So now, if you want to be here, you too, if you want to be sitting here, now whether you're in here or over there, it's fine. Just get in touch with me, speak up Monday, or just Robert Ian Bonick, Robert Ian Bonick, on whichever Instagram, Facebook. Get in touch, say, Rob, I want to be a guest. And to be really straightforward, like there's no, like, we only take, you know, like <laughs> two-time World Series champions only. No, it's got nothing to do with that, actually. If you're feeling the pull or that tap on the shoulder, it's your time, right? All that I say to you is just have the courage to do it right now. Don't delay. Just get in touch with me and say, Robbie, boom, get me on. Because there's a reason that you're listening to this. There's a reason why you're feeling that pull. And it's important not only for you, but for many other people who will watch you and relate to you because your field of reference is different to mine. It's different to Ryan's. It's different from the 99 or the 98 other guests that we've had on the show, right? So if you're feeling that pull, give in, surrender to it, tap us on the shoulder. Next week is AJ, which you guys know as Or Orimas. I can't even pronounce his surname. He is a mountain of a man. He's like 6'10". Like, he's going to be up here. But, but <laughs> so his handle is uh, human optimized, which I think is kind of interesting for the 100th episode of an of a, of a inspirational Q&A, which goes into the depth of human, the human experience. So I think it's kind of like not predestined, but kind of guided like, like, like that. And the last thing before I pass back on to Ryan is that Speak Up Monday, um, Inspiring Humanity is a podcast form of this. Because this is a studio audience, um, but we have people all over the world who want to be on, but we, they can't come live. So Speak Up Monday, Inspiring Humanity is a podcast which I'll be releasing uh, at various times. We just did Joe Ortega, uh, met him on Clubhouse. If you're not on Clubhouse, you should be. An amazing guy, beautiful story, um, love him, right? So Joe Ortega, we filmed it the other day and it's going to be shown pretty soon. So just look out for that one as well. And please, uh, next week, number 100, Speak Up Monday, Destination Indonesia number 100. Tune in or come to Tropical Nomad and see it live. Amazing guest. It's going to be fun. All right. So without further ado, I just want to say to you, my brother, thank you. Yeah, thank you. This was great.
Love you, my brother. Love you too. Yeah. Thank you. All right, man. Over to you, brother. Yeah. So I was just thinking about just two words, um, fight and forgiveness. Um, yeah, for, yeah. Those two are really coming up for me in this moment because today we talked about, you know, having a lot of fight and and having that grit to, you know, go through what you're going through, and and that fight also means being open about what you are going through, like, you know, trying, you know, fighting to keep something in doesn't make you tough. Saying it to somebody makes you tough because you're becoming super vulnerable. So um, for anyone going through anything, you know, purpose, whatever it is, you know, that fight to be open to other people because, you know, you, when you don't talk about these deep-seated issues um, that can make or break a life for sure um, and then the forgiveness piece is pretty much for myself but obviously it's like for anyone else like um, through these last few years um, I've made a lot of personally like just bad decisions um, you know with going too far with the psychedelic drugs and you know, some stuff that happened with my family and some of my friends and some of the, my friends aren't, you know, we don't really talk anymore. And like, I've spent so much time beating myself up internally about it, even like in the past few days, just thinking like, wow, I really wish that person was still in my life and hope, you know, hopefully they will be one day. But like, it's just time to just let that all fall off you know, for what I've done, you know, like you just say some things that you don't necessarily mean in the time. And it's just like, man, I've spent way too much time harming myself with words internally that it's time to just let it all go. So, you know, that I think that also is a huge component of mental health, not forgiving yourself for things that have happened in your past. I mean, they say technically depression is about your past and anxiety is about your future. So like, um, yeah, I think the depression is really what gets people. So fight and forgive for anyone out there that's hearing this and needs those, those two words, I think can really help propel you to your, the next thing in your life. So cheers. Yeah, it was great to be on. Respect, brother. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for